So yeah, guys. Um, so the idea of this uh, of the second workshop, uh, as we have visited initially, is really to to the community to do a dry hum over the said process. And the idea is that I'll be here supporting. So for example, if you guys hit any kind of blocker, like for example, get, getting the credentials, or maybe some errors, or maybe there are some questions, uh, the idea is that we will have this direct feedback so that, I mean, we can block quickly. So given that, uh, it may be a good idea to have one driver. Um, so we do have two options here. Uh, one of you guys could be the volunteer to be that driver. Or else, if he, anyone doesn't feel comfortable with that, uh, I could be the driver and let's say you guys would tell me what I should do. So I would like, uh, I mean, would like to know what are your, your, your thoughts and yeah. The floor is, floor is yours. Uh, Laura, uh, if you are speaking, your microphone is off. Yeah, it could be. He said that on the Discord. By the way, uh, do you guys uh, think, I mean, did you guys understand how the process did work on Monday? I mean, uh, was it clear what should be done and so on? I mean, how, what, what's your comfort level about that? Yeah, uh, in order to retrieve the data, we are going to have a VPN. If, I mean, if we do not have, I, I think it's fine to me to simply pass my VPN and we use today and I deactivated it uh, this evening. I don't think there is a problem to just to get unblocked. Hey, Laris.
Yeah, if Kamer Dan is supposed to run and he is not here, then we do have a blocker for this workshop. <laughs> <laughs> So some options is we, we do have a scheduled uh, workshop for this Monday. Uh, maybe we could do the dry home Monday instead. And I mean, for today, I think that we do have some options then. Uh, one is we can simply wrap it earlier than his I mean, simply use the Monday slot. Another one, we could use the time for discussions and I mean, because we are now here. So yeah, happy to, I mean, do anything that you guys think it's best. Yes. Yeah, I think it's the best approach. I mean, uh, so I think that everyone is, I mean, it's okay to simply wrap it earlier. I mean, if you guys want to ask any questions or discuss anything, I'll he I'm here, my, I mean, I do have these slots, so, I mean, if you guys want to make use of the time, I'm here. Uh, there is an uh, API endpoint on the Gitcoin production side, and as far, I mean, I'm not exactly sure how they use it, but as far as I know, uh, they do have some kind of dashboard. 
I'm not sure if it's a dashboard, but it's something related to deactivating the, uh, the quadratic funding for those users. So the ones that have one, they get deactivated, and zero, no. no. Yeah, so it's really the back end. As it's a back end service on the Gitcoin platform. And uh, as far as I remember, actually, so there is a catch because, I mean, there is a difference between the expected funding of what you see on the front end and the actual one. So that end point is to deactivate the, the expected funding on the front end. Because the final payoff, uh, there are some discussions, and I mean, it's only the site afterwards. So the idea of this is really to have, let's say, some kind of, I mean, just to make sure that the number that you see on the dashboard is reflecting your current state of knowledge. As far as I know, it's that. And, and this is an interesting question because it may be worth, worth for example, explaining why we have this column called aggregate score, why we don't simply have, a, I mean, just one column. Uh, the reason being is that, let's say, uh, it's a bit tricky, the decision of, let's say, saying someone is CBU or not. So we were to start on a situation because, I mean, uh, on one hand, it's, I mean, legally speaking, it's problematic, let's say, for us to tell, oh, this CBU is certainly user, uh, is, a, is a CBU. Uh, the thing is, it's useful to have the separation between, let's say, providing the, the numbers that allows you to assign CBU and actually making the decision of being CBU or not. So the, way to, the reason of why we have this aggregate score is because, I mean, it, because in the end, let's say we do have three scores for the users, so you need some kind of heuristic to tell, let's say, someone is CB or not, and someone must make that, must make that, must make, uh, do that decision of assigning that. Um, so, for example, if we were to integrate the community flags, uh, I think that there are, for example, two options. Uh, one, we could simply have, let's say, a second file, which is a score. Uh, but another option is we could have a fourth kind of score. So for example, right now we have the prediction score, the risk score, and the evaluation score. And we could have a fourth column called, let's say, the community prediction score. And the aggregate score would actually depend on some whole ba based on those four. Like for example, it could be something like, uh, first we, do, we give precedence for the evaluators. If not, we give precedence to the risks. If not, uh, we see if, if there is agreement between the block science prediction and the community predi uh, prediction. If, they, if they, there is consensus, then it's civil. If there, there is not consensus, we, be, we are conservative and we say no. Uh, of course, this is a business logic, but the main idea of the aggregate score is really that. It's giving the flexibility about how uh, we rank those scores. So, so it's really, let's say, uh, business logic about uh, what score is higher priority. So, so it's, a, it's a decision tree. The first uh, thing is the following. Uh, do we have an evaluation score? Yes or no? If we have evaluation score, that's it. Uh, if, someone, if a human says that it's CB with high confidence, then it's CB with high confidence. El uh, else, we simply treat it as no. But, of course, it's possible to have, let's say, more complicated uh, logic, like, for example, actually, I need to review the exact logic, but, but the idea of the uh, aggregate score is really to allow you to, let's say, uh, for example, it's a sequence of overrides. So high, high confidence evaluation scores come first. If not, uh, we use heuristics. And the reason why we use heuristics is because they are kind of super obvious. And if not, we use the prediction because, I mean, compared to those two, the machine learning prediction is the ones that we understand the least. Uh, 
So because theories can be evaluated, we can explain very clearly why is that. The prediction, I mean, we can say the machine learning algorithm said so, but we cannot uh, assign a, a causal factor just like the other two. Yes, I do have. Um, it's not on the file. I mean, on the zip file that I did send you, it's in, it's in there. Uh, let me. Sure, uh, let me see here. I think it's the predictions. On, uh, let me download that file here and I'll say you just now. Yeah. 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 So there is a. It's supposed to be the predicts. Uh, actually, every the aggregate score should have. So there is a catch in here because the file that I did send you was for testing purposes on, on how to start things. So it is this incomplete data, incomplete labels. So you, uh, I'll do the following. I'll send you a file from, for Hans 12 because it's going to be continuous. So, so you, are going, you, are, you are going to hear, deal with, let's say, that data that was actually used at, at production. Yeah. This, the schema is the same thing. Uh, it's just that, let's say, you are not going, because in this case, uh, the predictions, they were all one for some, I mean, maybe because it was too, too little data that I did feed. But let me check here. Uh, I'm almost sure that the CSV, that final CSV does have continuous scores. Uh, I'm going to check that now. Yes. Yeah, so I did check here, Laris. Indeed, it, it is continuous on the prediction score. Uh, I'm going to send out the score right now on the sad. Just send there. And let me see if I find the exact business logic here for the aggregate score. And, and this is one interesting way if we, if we need to merge the output from the two models, because we can use aggregate score, the business logic on the aggregate score to do that. And there is a variety of hurdles, like for example, if any of the algorithms did flag, we flag the user, or it could be something like, we only flag if the two models did flag. 
It really depends if we want to be more conservative or more aggressive. Yeah, they do come from the contributions. They are metrics over the users. The idea is that you take one user and you get some summary statistics, like the median, the, uh, the count. Uh, so a mounting SDT median is, I mean, given, yeah, you simply take out the contributions for that user and you take the median. And this is what would be one feature. Those are the contributors for Hans 12. Uh, I, I didn't understand. Uh, I mean, uh, what, what's the hinge of the data? Ah, yeah, so there are two use cases for the civil detection service. Uh, the first one is to have some kind of uh, real-time tracking about, I mean, how prevalent is the fraud during the rounds and also to deactivate it on the fly. That would be one use case. The second one is to delegate the payoffs after the rounds did end. Um, so on the first uh, use case, uh, and that's one of the reasons of why we've, we've been pushing, for example, for a data lake and also having some kind of service because the initial requirement uh, did ask for, let's say, running the extract data and doing predictions every one hour, two hours. And after that, let's say, you get the flags and you send it to this endpoint so that you update the Gitcoin production, uh, the, yeah, the Gitcoin uh, dashboard. So th this is one use case, simply update the front end. And the other one is the payoff, but the payoff it typically occurs uh, one week after the rounded end. And on the payoff is when you really assign who gets what uh, in terms of funding. So on this case, for example, uh, this data that I did send, it was a bit after the hunt did end because, I mean, in that case, we were interested in, let's say, who are the users that we are actually shooting off from the payoffs. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it's a lot of things. In, 
it's very hard to say that it's just one thing. It, the CPUs, they tend to, to uh, I mean, you, you always need to look at several things at once, and that's why any machine learning algorithm is useful. Like, for example, uh, there are some CPU attacks that are really dumb in the sense that they, you have a single IP, and that single IP is going to have, for example, 100 or 120 GitHub users. And all the GitHub users are new. So, and when you respect those obvious cases and you use, for example, theorisks, uh, you also, let's say, start noticing other things. Like, for example, they tend to use the same tokens. If you go to the distribution of, or for example, the medium of the contributions or the standard deviation of the contributions, they tend to have a certain shape. So, for example, CBUs usually they do not make huge contributions, they tend to small, do small contributions. And it's kind of weird on the standard deviation because they tend to have, to have small standard deviations, but it's not too small because what happens is that humans, humans they tend to contribute in two ways. Either they give the same amount for everyone, or they give very different amounts for each person. And CBUs, they tend to have this more well-behaved uh, distribution of the contributions. Uh, so it's kind of weird because, I mean, uh, having well-behaved contributions is a sign of CBUs, rather than... <laughs> uh, <laughs> because, I mean, that's what handle number, number generators do. Uh, uh, yes. Yes, and of course, uh, we cannot flag anyone because of the contribution amounts, but for example, if the contribution medium is small, the standard deviation is well-behaved. And also, I mean, the token that he's using is the same of the other CPUs. And then you have something fish like the, Git, the GitHub counter is new. Uh, I mean, things get, get uh, summing up. So, and of course, the more features we have, uh, the better because every feature is a sensor, so the more features we have, the more information we can use for, let's say, doing those uh, correlations. Yeah. yeah, so the context of optimality gap is a bit different from the CPU detection because the idea of optimality gap is really to be a um, possible meta indicator for collusion. Uh, so, co so it's important to I mean, clarify that it's a different behavior because CPU is really about, let's say, ma creating a lot of fake users and, and let's say maximizing rewards. Uh, while in collusion, it's more about I mean, it's, it's not that you are creating fake users. Uh, I mean, the users can be legit. Uh, uh, but, but in any case, optimality gap is a meta indicator. It depends a lot, for example, how you define a community. So initially, we did propose the neighborhood subgraph, but uh, it could be other, uh, I mean, we could use other criteria for defining community. Um, And, but, but yeah, uh,
no, no, my little gap, uh, the exact meaning of the little gap is the following. Um, suppose, that, suppose that you have a community, uh, no matter how you define. And this community is defined by grants and users. And user, you can understand that, I mean, we are understanding as, Git, as a GitHub handle, but we also could understand, understand as a wallet. There is no problem. It's a different interpretation, but we could use that. Yeah. Um, and today is the following. Uh, given the quadra I mean, given the contributions that you have on this co community, uh, you have a certain amount that you get from matching by using the quadratic funding algorithm. Uh, but it's possible to reward this, this community. So let's say instead of you getting the heal contribution pattern, what would happen, for example, if you rearrange so that you have an optimal pattern? So, that, so the idea is that, let's say, if you rearrange those users and grants and get that optimal pattern and the optimal funding, you can divide that optimal funding by the actual funding and you have a score that tells, let's say, how optimal the actual pattern is. And it's possible to compute that. And actually, first we were doing simulations. We were doing simulation annealing, but Octopus did find a, a deterministic formula for that, a mathematical formula, which made, I mean, if we, if we were to present that again, it would be way easier. Uh, <laughs> because it's definitely, uh, way less expensive computationally. Uh, and we did have a hypothesis, and it's important to, let's say, that this, say that this is a hypothesis in the sense that, let's say, we do not know if it is true or not. But, but we do have the hypothesis that if you get, uh, let's say, communities where the actual funding is very close to the perfect funding, uh, this could be an indicator yeah, because I mean, this, this is sort of a strategic behavior because people, I mean, people usually they tend to contribute sort of handily or using, for example, mechanisms like preferential attachment. It's not, uh, so having the perfect uh, funding on, on, let's say, on, on a real life scenario, it's a bit suspicious because, I mean, this is not very nature. This is indicative of, of a strategic behavior. So our, our policies would be the following. Uh, if we get the communities where the optimality gap is very low, we're very close to perfect. If we were to inspect them, uh, our hypothesis is that, let's say, this could be a good indicator of, let's say, fraud, like, for example, maybe someone is, yeah, uh, sort of like that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but, but there are some things. So for example, one, uh, one obstacle, for example, for that is that, for example, the notion of mobility gap is a bit ill-defined in the sense that uh, the mobility gap is a metric for a community. For a, and, and you can defin, define the community in several ways. So we were using the idea of, of, the idea of neighborhood subgraph, which is each grant, you take a three degree separation and that's it. And using that definition for community, uh, to be fair, the results were not very promising. So, so, yeah, so we did sort of pause a bit because, yeah, first because the results weren't so promising, and second because after that uh, we started to have a lot of CBO attacks on Gitcoin, so we switched gears from collusion detection to CBO detection, which is a different approach. Uh, yeah, I mean, the, we did investigate collusion at the beginning of the last year. And I think that on April or May, we started to have lots and lots of CBUs. And it was kind of fun because back then, we, everyone was not too much concerned with CBU because Gitcoin was using um, Bright ID, some solutions. And we, made, we did thought that, let's say, by having that trust bonus and also by having the pairwise uh, total incentive on the quadratic funding formula, we did thought that uh, that let's say this wouldn't be too much of a problem. <laughs> and then, yeah. And for that reason, we did focus on collusion at first. But I mean, given the events, we. But, but yeah, that's the history. And. Uh... Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, the... yeah, I do think it's interesting. And I, I mean, one thing that I think that it's important going forward is uh, because on one hand, let's say, the more features we can include on the detection process, the more sensors we are going to have and so on. But at the same time, it's important to do, let's say, that, let's say exploratory data analysis in order to understand anything that we put. And uh, it would be cool, for example, so for example, one of the ideas that we had earlier for, let's say, the community development of the CBO detection is that, let's say, it could be cool, for example, if we try to segment as much as possible the, the difference between, for example, uh, observing a pattern and describing, let's say, this pattern in you defined ways, like for example, uh, oh, we have these wallets here, and there's the parent wallet. Uh, it could be useful if we have some uh, metric from network analysis that somehow provides a number between zero and one about how much they are correlated. And given this you the script, it would, it would be cool, for example, let's say on, on the first layer, you have, for example, someone that just proposes. On the second layer, on the second phase, you could have, for example, a data analyst or a data scientist that, let's say, could take that observation and, let's say, would spend the time to do exploratory data analysis and provide, for example, maybe three to five well-defined well metrics so that they can be included on the features, uh, features.py. And on the third phase, a software engineer that, let's say, takes those well-defined uh, features and, let's say, make sure that it's implemented according to the best practices that we have. So that, because it's a fact, I mean, uh, data scientists, the, the data analysis, they are usually too bu busy, so someone must provide the backlog for them. And at the same time, data scientists, they are usually very bad at writing, let's say, maintainable code, so it's useful to have a software engineer doing that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, <laughs> yeah. I, uh, I mean, it happens. The best that we do, can do is really to, I mean, try to have keys to use interfaces and make sure that we can use the best that everyone can offer. Yeah, okay. So, by the way, if you guys also have any questions, I think I'm um, on Discord, so feel free to ask you anything. Could be directly related, but if you guys want also to ask more questions about the history, it's fine too. I, I do like answering questions. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, just a uh, that zip file, it's straightforward. I think that probably the weirdest file, it would be the one for the HAM data, because the HAM data is a HDL fi HDF file. So, yeah, probably it's the file that the, anyone would have more questions. The other ones are, I mean, it's just CSV and JSONs, and that pico fire for the module. <laughs> uh, yeah. So 
So, see you guys later. Thanks, guys.